My name is Christopher Hess. I'm one of the neurologists at the Movement Disorder Center. I'm also the director of the VA uh, Parkinson's Disease Consortium here in Gainesville. And I'm going to be talking to you today about neuroimaging, all the different ways that we can look at the brain uh, in movement disorders. And the reason why I think this is an important topic for people that are relatively new to Parkinson's disease is because what usually happens, sir, come on. Um, what usually happens is patients will come to a movement disorder center and they'll wait three, four, five months sometimes for their appointment and they'll meet their doctor and they'll examine them and talk to them and, and they'll say, okay, you have Parkinson's disease and very often the patient will say, that's it? I mean, you looked at me for five or 10 minutes. What, what about the tests? What about the, the, the big, long technical things with the abbreviations like MRIs and CTs and DAT scans and, and EMGs and EEGs? Well, where are all these tests? Aren't you gonna do these to make sure that I really have Parkinson's disease? And sometimes that can be complicated by the fact that sometimes the referring doctor will have done a lot of these tests that maybe needed to be done or maybe didn't need to be done. So what we're gonna talk about today is what role the various ways that we have to look at the brain, uh, what role that plays in the diagnosis and the management of Parkinson's disease. So the role of Imaging in Parkinson's disease is changing. We didn't get from amphibian to Groucho overnight. It, it's sort of changed over time. And um, what I'm going to talk to you about is some of the, we're going to cover all the different modalities of imaging. And in the process of doing that, we're also going to cover all the different roles that uh, imaging plays in the diagnosis and management of Parkinson's disease. We'll talk a little bit about how it evolved over time as well. So this is a CT scan. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to, to, not how to read them, but you'll be sort of mini experts in, in, in how to look at images over time. And we'll talk about how that was the, the earliest uh, modality to develop. And over time, we developed MRI scans, which give us a little bit a bigger picture, a little bit longer, give you some more uh, stress when you're getting them. And, we're going to talk about DAT scans, which is going to be one of the focuses of the talk today because a lot of people have heard about this. They say, do I need a DAT scan? Is that, is that part of the workup? Is that something that I need? So we'll talk about that as well. And then we'll touch on a few uh, of the more research-oriented ways to uh, image the brain and, and the role that that plays now and the role that it might play in the future. Okay, so when we think about it's always good to try to develop a framework of what you're going to talk about. And, and when we think about what the role of neuroimaging is in Parkinson's disease, there's a couple things that, that really stand out that allow you to put everything into a, a nice, organized framework. And the first is identifying secondary causes of Parkinson's disease, so or Parkinsonism. So Parkinson's disease is the actual disease with the actual pathology that causes these symptoms. There are, as Dr. Malati mentioned earlier, lots of other processes that can happen in the brain that can result in symptoms of Parkinsonism, right? The rigidity, the slowness, the postural instability, uh, the, the tremor that sometimes happens. So all these things aren't Parkinson's disease, so we're going to talk about the role of, of uh, neuroimaging in that case. We're going to talk about what the use and limitations are of using the various neuroimaging techniques in differentiating Parkinson's disease from other diseases. So in some cases it's helpful, in some cases it's not. And then we'll talk a little bit about the state of the art that's uh, going on right now and how things might change in the future. And what I, the take home message from this and what I hope that everybody will get an idea of is this is supposed to be the, the side for people that are relatively newly diagnosed and you want to be able to walk out of here knowing, you know, I, I've been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Do I need a CAT scan? Do I need an, an MRI? Do I need a DAT scan? Are these things that are that are that are important for me to have as, as part of the, the process of my diagnosis and management? Okay, so first in, in uh, talking about uh, identifying secondary causes of Parkinsonism. So this is a very important role of imaging, and it's one of uh, the earliest roles that imaging had because 
Parkinson's disease, as we'll talk about a little bit more, it doesn't have a characteristic appearance on a CT scan. It doesn't look a particular way on an MRI where you can say this is Parkinson's or this isn't Parkinson's. So a lot of the role of CT scans, especially in symptoms that haven't been there that long, is in identifying secondary causes of Parkinson's disease and just in making sure that those secondary causes are not present. So sometimes it can be helpful to, to identify what's not happening or when, something's, when nothing's happening. So this is a picture of Congress where largely nothing's been happening for the past year, and it's an example where it can be important to talk about these types of things. So, Both CT scan and MRI uh, can help to identify secondary causes of Parkinson's. So uh, we'll start by talking about CT scans, and then we'll, we'll move on and talk about conventional MRIs. So when I think of a CT scan, I think of what you see on the right side. You might think of uh, what you see on the left side. But if we focus on the right side, um, what you're looking at is an image through the brain. You can sort of imagine that you're looking up from, and this is a small group, so I'll step away from the microphone. If you're looking up from the feet this way, you're looking at a slice through the head as if the person's head was, oh, was up here, and the, the toes are down here, this is the left side, this is the right side, and this is a cut right through the brain, so you're seeing the skull, you're seeing the brain tissue, you're seeing the little areas of, of fluid-filled cavities inside the brain. It's a grainy picture, it's, it's not very high definition, but it still is very helpful in some situations where either a patient can't get an MRI for various reasons, or if a patient has symptoms that are, are evolving relatively rapidly and you want to get a study right away. So these are just some examples of patients who presented with Parkinsonism. So the patient on the left presented with a month uh, of symptoms, initially start, was being treated for Parkinson's disease, and ended up having bilateral chronic subdural uh, hematomas. So here's the brain tissue, and here's the bleeding that developed after a fall on both sides. And it took a month into the disease for them to realize that this is what the cause was, and it wasn't Parkinson's disease. The patient on the opposite side had a meningioma, and you can see here, this is again a CT scan, here's the tumor. This is the edema that is associated with it. And it's not even particularly in the area that's associated with Parkinsonism. But this patient was treated for Parkinson's disease for almost 10 years before they realized what actually was going on and they sized the tumor and then the symptoms got better. So these things can happen and there are these mimics out there that can look like Parkinson's disease. And especially if, if someone's being treated by someone who's not as familiar with all the intricacies and, and subtleties that can happen, that you can see in Parkinson's disease. So this does sometimes happen. And in that case, CT scan has uh, a tremendous amount of importance because it's very easy to do. Just about anybody can get the test done. And although the picture's not great, if there's something grossly abnormal in the brain, if there's blood, if there's a tumor, um, you can see it and you'll know, or at least you'll be able to get an idea of whether or not that's related or not. So in thinking about, okay, I have Parkinson's disease, do I need a CT scan? You don't need a CT scan if you've been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. In general, one of the themes that I'm gonna be talking about both with regard to CT or MRI, if you have a very classic Parkinson's disease and you're seeing a neurologist who's very experienced and knows when things look a little bit off and you're worried a little bit and you might want to get an image just to be sure, or when you have classic Parkinson's disease where there's really not much of a, a, a need for imaging, uh, most guidelines don't require imaging in Parkinson's disease and certainly there's no requirement of a CT scan. So if you've been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and you've never had a CT scan in your life, don't worry about it. You don't particularly need it across the board. Now, there are those patients like I showed where Patients were misdiagnosed, but uh, it's not something that everybody needs. Okay, so MRIs. So MRI was the next sort of uh, uh, step taken towards better imaging and better processes. And what this cartoon shows is that the doctor saying, okay, this is done, we'll slide you in there, scan your brain, and see if we can find out why you've been having these spells of claustrophobia. <laughs> so, for any of you who've actually had an MRI, this is very familiar, you get the banging sound, you get, if 
feels like you're closed in, this thing is right in front of your face, and, and it can be a rather stressful experience. But the pictures that we get from an MRI are significantly better than what's available, uh, what had previously been available from CT scans. And preferentially, if there's a reason to get brain imaging, we try to get an MRI unless there's some reason not to, if there's a reason to get it. So again, all these, these pictures, most of them are the same orientation where you're looking from the feet up. Here you see the eyes. Here's the brain structure. This one you're looking from the front to the back. And these two are the same. So in these cases, you can see the, the you don't have to know the details. You can, I pointed out the brain structure. You can see that the picture just looks better. It's easier to see. It's, got a, it's like looking at a better TV compared to a TV from the 1960s. And in these cases, these were all patients who had Parkinsonism. And this was a patient with vasculitis who had a very strategic stroke in a very important area. This was a patient who's had multiple stroke risk factors and had multiple strokes over many years. So they actually had what's called vascular Parkinsonism, not Parkinson's disease. And this is a patient who has lesions in the area of the basal ganglia, which is the area that's involved in Parkinson's disease due to renal failure. And so their symptoms were actually due to a metabolic cause. So all these these things can be seen on MRI. Some of these can be seen on MRI where you wouldn't see them on a CT scan. So another group of examples where it's really important in these particular cases uh, to go ahead and get imaging. But remember, these patients probably didn't look like the regular characteristic Parkinson's disease patients. They were Parkinsonian, but there were things about them in most cases who have one of these diseases where red flags would go up for the clinician who was experienced with Parkinson's disease to be able to say, you know, I think that there's something just not quite right here. I think we really need to go ahead and get an image to make sure that, uh, as we said, as we showed in Congress, nothing else is going on. So, you've been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Do you need an MRI? So, a lot of times, if you do get the diagnosis, uh, by the time people see us at the Movement Disorder Center, Often they've already had an MRI, and usually it doesn't show anything. And MRIs in patients who do have Parkinson's disease that's due to Parkinson's disease and not some other form of Parkinsonism, they don't really have anything that's clearly visible on a regular MRI that's specific for Parkinson's disease. So it's not going to give you a diagnosis by getting an MRI. Just like CT scan is not going to give you a diagnosis. And EEGs where they put the little electrodes on and EMGs where they put the needles in. None of that is going to be characteristic for Parkinson's disease. None of those tests are really available. So this sort of brings us back to that uh, patient who came into their doctor's office after their long wait and said, wow, that's it. You really, you're, 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 you're making the diagnosis based on how I look. And that is how the diagnosis is made in the vast majority of cases. I do have a lot of instances uh, where I will get brain imaging if even the slightest little thing makes me worry that there could be something other than very typical Parkinson's disease. Uh, but not in every case, and as I said, it's not really part of the guidelines. Okay, so we talked about the role of neuroimaging in Parkinson's disease. Um, we talked about first identifying the secondary causes of Parkinsonism. So the second thing I'm going to talk about is differentiating Parkinson's disease and from other neurologic diseases. And this can be broken up into from other forms of Parkinsonism. So I think Dr. Malati mentioned there are other forms of Parkinsonism, like what are called atypical forms of Parkinson's disease, progressive supranuclear palsy, cortical basal ganglionic degeneration, multiple system atrophy. These are all diseases that um, are Parkinson plus syndrome, so they can cause Parkinsonism. They're a neurodegenerative disease. There's no clear mass effect or something wrong in the brain like I showed in those other pictures, but they're different. They don't respond to the medications in the same way. So what's, what's the role of neuroimaging in separating those from Parkinson's disease? And similarly, what's the role of neuroimaging in separating out Parkinson's from other diseases that can sometimes look like Parkinson's disease? That's another question that, that often comes up a lot as well. So, in some cases, this is, this is just regular conventional MRI. 
Getting an MRI if someone, if you suspect an atypical form of Parkinson's disease, can be very helpful. So, what you see here is a side view of the brain with the nose on this side and the back of the head here, and it's just as if you sliced it right down the middle. And you can see this being a uh, normal brain, this being the brain in a patient who has what's called progressive supranuclear palsy. If you look at the diameter of this area right here, you can see how here this sort of comes to a very sort of sharp point with, with a, a bit of a string maybe on, on it. It's called a hummingbird sign, to where this is, is much more of a just sort of a triangle, right? So this is a very characteristic sign that we see in someone who has progressive uh, PSP. So in this case, seeing this, if you were on the border of saying someone did or didn't have PSP, can be a very helpful <coughs> tool. In addition, looking at different parts of the cerebellum, which is a part of the, this is the cerebellum here, this is a part of the brain that's involved in coordination. If you look at the width of this in different areas, this can also help you to get an idea of whether or not progressive uh, PSP is in place, is present. And there are studies that have been done looking at what's called the magnetic resonance Parkinsonism index. So basically they just do a calculation based on some of these numbers to see if there's if the numbers that they see match more of what's uh, typically seen in Parkinson's disease or more of what's typically seen in PSP. So at least in this example, you see here, this is the range of, of numbers that's seen when you do this calculation in regular people, people with possible Parkinson's and probable Parkinson's disease. And you see the range is pretty different in people with PSP. So when it's there, this is a very helpful tool. And if you suspect atypical Parkinson's disease, most neurologists will go ahead and get an MRI to see if those, those hints are there to help us to try to get an idea of whether it's present or not. Sometimes you can tell just by the clinical presentation, but sometimes you can't. Sometimes regular Parkinson's disease can start to mimic some of the other diseases. So this would be an example of where getting a conventional MRI could be very helpful. So what you see here, and it's a little hard to see with the, the light, is this is what's called the hot cross bun sign. So you'll see a line going down here in the area of the ponds. And when you have degeneration in that area, normally you don't see this cross. And when this is there, it's pretty sensitive for people who have what's called MSA. This is what's called the morning glory sign. It's named because the, the appearance of the brainstem in this particular area gives an appearance like the morning glory of flower to where typically you have a bit more of a rounded appearance here. So these are all qualitative, meaning that someone looks at it and makes the decision normal or not, um, bits of information. So they're very helpful uh, in some situations, but they're, it's not like there's, so we talked about the numbers that they calculate, but that's not a, a process that's FDA approved, for example, for the diagnosis of one disease versus the other. So these things are hints, the things that can help a clinician in the same way when we test your reflexes or when we test your, your memory or your thinking. These are things that we can use to help make the correct diagnosis, but they don't stand uh, independently on their own. But these are examples where you can sometimes get an idea that an atypical form of Parkinson's is in place just by going ahead and getting the MRI. But as I said before, not everybody needs it. So this is what's called an FPG PET scan. So over the years, uh, primarily uh, one researcher in Long Island has taken lots of patients who have Parkinson's disease and looked at how the brain metabolism works in different areas of the brain. And what he's found is that in general, Patients with Parkinson's disease have a pretty consistent pattern of increased metabolic activity and decreased metabolic activity in specific areas of the brain. So this test is very helpful from a research point of view. Um, it, it's available and there's, there's a researcher that's local to you that can actually do the test and give you some information based on their research, uh, it can be helpful, and I've used it clinically before, um, especially when I was close to the doctor who had developed a lot of this stuff. It's a little harder when you're not right there, and, and it's not a test that's largely available to most people. 
there's not a place in Florida that I'm aware of that you could get this test done and they'd have the full research database to where it would be very helpful to do. But it's, again, it's called an FDG PET scan. It's not FDA approved. It can be helpful in some situations. There are patterns for the other different types of Parkinsonism. There's even patterns that they've looked at for essential tremor. But again, it's, it's a tool. It's, it's one part of the full clinical impression that uh, a neurologist uses to sort of make uh, the decision about whether what, what disease someone has. So if you've heard about FDG PET scans or you have a friend or, or you read about it, uh, it's not something that's generally part of the uh, typical clinical evaluation for a patient who has Parkinson's disease. So some people might have heard about ultrasounds and getting an ultrasound uh, of their brain to help in the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. You might see this coming out in the, the literature that's coming out of Europe. Uh, there is research being done looking at trying to tell if people have Parkinson's disease based on the area of the brain stem uh, or an area of the basal ganglia and brain stem that's involved and in, degenerates in Parkinson's disease. But not that popular here in the United States. It's not FDA approved. And one of the reasons is, so this is what you actually see. And there are some people that are very, very good at looking at these. But what most people see when they look at this is just a whole lot of jumbled garbage. And it takes a lot of training and a lot of skill. And even when you have that level of training and skill, a lot of patients don't have the, the, the uh, necessary fitness of the bone in the, in the temporal area of the brain to actually do this. So if you've read or heard about um, doing ultrasound, transcranial ultrasound for diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, there's research being done. It had been exciting at one point. I think it's sort of tapering off with regard to the excitement, although there's still some groups that are using it. There's definitely no indication that anyone, if you've heard about it, that's been diagnosed with or, is con or your doctor's considering diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, there's really no reason to get a, a transcranial ultrasound. So this is just, again, a, a picture of that. Um, so the DAT scan. This is, this is the test that everybody usually wants to know about. This is the one that people have heard about. Uh, sometimes people will come to us with the, having had the test this is the, that's off of the DATSCAN website. I guess they've had the test, but he's very happy. His son is there with him. They're all very happy that they've had the DATSCAN. So do you need the DATSCAN? Uh, this is a question that comes up a lot. So what the DATSCAN is, is there's, there's a variety of, of chemicals that are present in dopaminergic neurons. And you can make a chemical, like an exam for example, the DAT scan, you, there's a chemical that's taken up by a particular transporter, what's called the dopamine transporter. And if you make a chemical that binds there and then put a little radioactive tracer to it that won't hurt you in any way, but it'll allow us to image each one of these. So if, if, if the, the chemical is taken up by this transporter and it's got this little radioactive part to it that makes it visible on imaging because it's giving off very, very small amounts of radiation, it allows us to get a visual image of the area of the brain where this type of neurocommunication is taking place. So here you can see on this side, you have pretty bright what's called caudate areas and a nice little tail that comes out here. They're relatively symmetric. Where on this side, you have loss of the tail on both sides. It's not as bright in the caudate area and it looks much more asymmetric. Uh, one side compared to the other. So that's the dot scan, and that's what we see. In the vast majority of locations and places, this is a qualitative diagnosis or decision that's made, meaning you go and you get this test done, and then the radiologist looks at it the same way that we just looked at it and says, normal or abnormal. There's no, um, it's not like when you get your blood taken and, and they're looking at the glucose level and you get a number and you know what the normal range is. This is just that radiologist's opinion of normal or abnormal. And, that, and a lot of times the people will describe it as either comma-shaped or dot-like. So a couple quick things about the DAT scan. If people do get it, they need to take a iodine to protect their thyroid because it's radioactive. Um, you have to 
there's a time window that you have to uh, take the, the reagent before you actually get imaged. Then there's a time window that you have to do the imaging. All that has to be done at the right time or else you can get spurious or incorrect results. Uh, and these are some of the patterns that you can sometimes see. So the normal pattern you see on top, the asymmetric patterns, abnormal, bilaterally decreased and asymmetric, and then absent binding on both sides on the bottom part, and then asymmetric on the top. Those are just some of the, the patterns that we sometimes see. And when you look back at the people who were doing uh, the studies that this was FDA approved off of, the, the, the experts at reading this, they had very, very high what's called sensitivity and specificity. The ability to detect Parkinson's if it's there, to the, the ability to say it's not there if it's not there. So it's a very useful tool, especially when these people were doing it. Now, there are some problems associated with this. And again, this is just some other pictures uh, going from normal to some of the abnormals. And, and you can see, especially for some of these, sometimes it's not so easy to tell. I mean, when you take the two of extremes, it's very obvious. But a lot of times, patients have an appearance that's somewhere between the normal and what they're uh, indicating there is abnormal. So when this test was first approved, and it's been about three years now, people were, were very worried about what the implications of this test could be. It's a great tool if you're getting your care at a tertiary care movement disorder center where your doctor is very, very experienced in, in movement disorders and uses the test only when it's appropriate to use it, only when it can give useful information and not potentially send you in the wrong direction. So there was a study done in 2010 uh, where they looked at this type of image and they used 30 nuclear medicine physicians, the ones that read it, that have what's called some experience with this type of test. They took 12 scans. They said to the doctors, here are the 12 scans. You look at all of them. You tell me if it's normal, abnormal, or equivocal, meaning that you're not sure if it's abnormal or not. Right? These 12 scans were, were pulled out of a database of about three or 400 scans specifically to cover the full range of what's out there. So this was the degree of, of uh, agreement. So in one case, the percentage agreement was only 30 to 39 percent. And that happened all the way up. So there were four cases where the agreement was very low. 100 percent only occurred in three out of the 12 cases. Only two cases where they agreed 90 to 99 percent of the time. And Three cases, 70 to 79% of the time. So what does this tell us? This definitely tells us a couple things. This is an FDA-approved test that your insurance will pay for. And every radiologist who will, could get paid for this test will do the test. If you go to a, a center and you say, do you do DAT scans? As long as they have the FDA uh, the approval to do it, because it's a cocaine analog, they'll do the test. But it doesn't particularly mean that they have the experience to read the test correctly. And what you're seeing is an example of that, uh, a wide variety of experience in reading it. And remember, this isn't like reading the, the blood test. This is just we, the same way that we look at it. They'll look at it on a computer and just say it's normal or it's abnormal. So this is something that really needs to be considered. The DAT scan also doesn't differentiate between the various neurodegenerative forms of atypical Parkinsonism, like PSP, MSA, Parkinson's disease. All of them will have an abnormal DAT scan. So this, the test will not be helpful in differentiating between these diseases. Where it will really be helpful, and especially to the experienced movement disorders expert, is if they're not sure about whether this is Parkinson's or drug-induced Parkinson's disease, or if they have a strong suspicion for vascular Parkinsonism, or uh, if they think that there's a possibility that um, you have, for example, a central tremor. And some patients with a central tremor can look just a little bit Parkinsonian, and for that reason, it can be helpful to get the test done. So you've been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Do you need a DAT scan for the vast majority of people that have been, ex that have been diagnosed by someone who's an experienced doctor who sees a lot of patients with movement disorders? No, you don't. In the vast majority of patients that I see, I don't even think about doing the DAT scan because it's not going to provide any new information. And sometimes when you do it, you just don't even believe it because you can see that the patient has Parkinson's disease. And if they do the scan wrong or they uh, develop a, uh, if there's a problem with the administration of the medications, then uh, th they can give spurious results. So we talked today about 
what the indications are for the various different forms of neuroimaging that's available, CAT scans, MRIs, DAT scans. We don't have time to talk about uh, what's sort of on the, the, uh, the research pipeline for, for uh, developing new methods of neuroimaging, but one last slide that I want to show is how the neuroimaging techniques that are being developed might influence the neurology and movement disorders consult of the future. So it's possible that five, ten years from now, you might go in to see your movement disorder, your, your neurologist, and in addition to doing the clinical examination, you'll be videotaped. And I don't think this, this video may or may not work, but we'll see. This is just a, 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 some studies that I did a number of years ago, they'll take your movements, they'll quantify them, they'll actually give a number to the to some of the things that we look at visually. You'll go ahead and get an MRI that's, that gets done. It'll confirm your diagnosis in a way that we can't do right now. You might get a connectivity study that will tell you in the future potentially what your risk is based on the pattern of neurodegeneration that's developed uh, in you, whether you might be more likely to get apathy or more likely to get depression or some of these other things that Dr. Bowers talked about. And these are things that are potentially on the horizon uh, and ways that neuroimaging can contribute to the continued management and to the diagnos diagnosis of patients in the future. So thank you all for listening, and I'm going to stick around for a minute if any of you have any questions.